Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Edge 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to IBM Edge. This is theCUBE, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. Callista Redmond is here. She's the director of Open Power. Welcome to theCUBE. Good to see you. Thank you for coming Thanks. on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So Open Power, you know, when it, when it started, there were a lot of skeptics. And, oh, okay, you know, it's sort of a Hail Healthy Mary skeptics. by IBM. But yeah. Healthy skeptics, but I think you've um, proved that this is a real deal. Thanks, thanks. So congratulations. So give us the update on Open Power. Well, you know, we're uh, about three years in and we've successfully gone from five members, the initial uh, sort of uh, renegade crew, to 262 members. Uh, so we've had tremendous growth. I mean, these, these are folks who are really investing in the architecture, investing their, their time, resources, and energy to make power a very uh, compelling platform in the, in the market. Not just a viable one, but a compelling one. So, well that's, that's a good point, right? You got to have viability, but viability in and of itself is kind of table stakes right, right, in exactly. this game. So what does it mean to, to open power? That means basically everything, all the IP that IBM has developed, put into the open source? So community? we are basically making it easy for everyone to have a starting point. Whether you're coming in at the chip level, the board level, the system level, the integration level, through the software, and being able to really optimize through every layer of that stack. Uh, and now we're even moving from software into industry specific instantiation. So we're getting into a lot of the uh, traditional HPC space, um, you know, through personalized medicine, instrumented science, uh, really seeing some compelling differentiation that you can achieve on power. Uh, we're also uh, moving very quickly into cloud and uh, enterprise workloads. Uh, in, in many ways, it's, it's a little bit of HPC for everyone. Uh, we've all got a lot of uh, data to sift through and value to glean from that. So we had Tom Rosamilia on earlier this morning and we were talking about the hyperscalers yeah. and he said, hey, I, we're an arms dealer. I want, me, we as in, not IBM, but the, the systems division. Yeah. I want to sell into those hyperscalers. It seems to us that the best chance of doing that is power, and yeah. generally in open power specifically. So talk about hyperscale as an opportunity for yeah. you and what kind of traction you have. Obviously Google was one of the, yeah. the five rogues. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and so they're a hyperscaler, I think. Uh, so, they're pretty, so, pretty sizable, yeah. well, you know? <laughs> what's the opportunity there and how are you guys doing? You know, I think it really speaks to the consumption model. I mean, the consumption model for systems generally has bridged beyond the traditional systems providers. It's not just a game for IBM or any of the other big systems houses to be in. But in, in some measures, those hyperscales are going directly to manufacturers in Taiwan. We want to be the arms dealer to that platform, right? So whether they are going directly to engaging with a manufacturer or whether they want to engage directly with IBM, we're here to help you know, move that forward. Uh, the other consumption model shift that we've seen is obviously in cloud. I mean, you can't talk to anyone right now that does not have a cloud strategy, whether it's private, hybrid, uh, public cloud strategy, um, that is essential for open power. And you know, we truly believe that we can be the arms dealer for those cloud providers as much as those hyperscalers. Uh, and you know, so those two consumption models, whether it's direct in the manufacturer or through cloud resources, you know, on-prem, off-prem, what have you, we need to be able to serve that need. And to do that compelling, uh, in a compelling fashion, you have to have workloads that really take advantage of that hardware. So Calista, how important is Little Endian in that whole equation in terms of binary compatibility with all the applications that are out there? And what yeah. kind of catalyst has that been for your business? So I think the decision to go from Big Endian to Little Endian or byte ordering was as important as uh, to the open power strategy as it was for us to take an open approach to the architecture. Mm. Right, because without the capability to migrate workloads quickly and easily, to port and recompile and get to parity with your x86 systems, and then to start adjusting the dials and start getting your magnitude improvements, without making that decision, the hill was too, far, too high to climb. Okay, so you're basically attacking this, I know Stu, you want to jump in, <laughs> uh, with an ecosystem approach. What are your aspirations for 
the, the, the ecosystem in terms of its market penetration. I saw some data the other day about 20% of the market that you're looking for by some certain point of time. Can you clarify 20 that 20 by 2020 would be good. 20 by 2020, yeah. is yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> so uh, you know, we really feel that power is a, is a compelling differentiator uh, to kind of aggregate workloads on the platform. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us to effectively do that, we have to put a stake in the ground and, and go for it. Uh, to do that, we need to continue building out that community. And that community are, is not just composed of the ISVs that are coming to the platform, it's also the in-house developers that are already tuning their own workloads to best perform in their data centers. And so for that, we're doing numerous POCs, we're, you know, we're adopting and, and embracing many uh, open source databases, and that's you know, a true statement that, that you'll see across the IBM portfolio. It's, it's not uh, power alone. Mm. Calista, so often open source equates to uh, drama for those of us that watch the environment. Think back to you know, the earliest days of Linux, uh, you know, watch OpenStack for, for the last bunch of years as to who owns it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even more recently, uh, you know, Docker is getting a lot of discussion as to you know, is Docker having too much control over it. Yeah. Um, you know, IBM, of course, you know, the founder of you know, power and doing open power. How have you avoided, uh, you know, struck that balance between allowing the ecosystem to grow, making sure that IBM can still make revenue and allowing the ecosystem to flourish? By making power much more relevant and more compelling to the industry, to our stakeholders across the community, not just to the software providers who want to diversify the platforms they're on, but to the, uh, the end user who wants freedom of choice and long -term, a long-term durable strategy, just as much as each one of those has a cloud strategy, they also have an open strategy. I mean, open is, is very much mainstream now. It's not relegated to you know, some corner cases uh, in the data center. Uh, having the ability to uh, uh, have the base building blocks across your portfolio of workloads, of software that you're deploying in your data center is, is completely critical to your strategy. And you know, it, it speaks to the price performance as well, right? I mean, you've got to be able to sort of leverage the, the base building blocks as a key piece of accelerating your development uh, for those workloads. And containers are going to be a big part of that, right? Can you speak to kind of the global impact that open powers have? I guess especially want to understand how China uh, sees this as an opportunity. China's done a lot with open source and know there's yeah. interest in open power there. So, so China is very interesting. I would say that they are the biggest um, you know, highlight on our sort of the domestic IT agenda. They are very keen to have a local IT economy. What country doesn't want that, right? They want to invent it, produce it, and consume it in China for China. And you can start with a blank sheet of paper or you can take an open approach to that. And by providing an open approach to that, by in ensuring that we are with them every step of the way, we are providing them with the, you know, the most durable strategy to go forward. And, and you know, for that, you've got to have uh, you know, sort of the, the state level permissions and, and uh, you know, sub levels of support. And we've been able to sort of build that trust, build those relationships. So and that, that, you know, that translates to volume, right? That translates to volume. So China clearly wants to be self-sufficient, not, not yeah. only just for local markets, right? Potentially for, for global markets. Yeah. It's got, a, it's, it's got, what, some number four, maybe of the top 10 Top Gun supercomputer yeah. Yeah. results, maybe even more than that. It's yeah. got its own Linux operating system. So yeah. do you see IBM, become, I mean IBM, China becoming a global power? And, and why is IBM comfortable with that? Because it's, you're part of your sort of ecosystem, or? It's part of the broader community, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, we have uh, use cases that are, are very alive in China that we've talked about through China Mobile, through Tencent, of right. uh, you know, large-scale deployments that are comfortable on power and who are investing in power. So, so that gets you volume, drives costs down, mm -hmm. brings adoption up. Yeah, and so it brings additional workloads. It fosters that broader community. The community is the end user, it's the software providers, it's the, the hardware providers. Everyone is looking for that traction to get going in particular markets. And IBM is part of that value chain, obviously yeah. with software yeah. and also hardware components, integration yeah. components. Where, where specifically does the IBM power group within the systems division play in that whole ecosystem? Where do you make your money? So we're, uh, our business model is really at all steps of the chain. 
right? I mean, we can come in with systems. We have a great portfolio of, of power systems to offer to those clients. We have a great portfolio of services that we can offer. We have a, a wonderful stack on, of, on the software side that, that runs really well on power. Um, and so across the value chain, as power becomes more compelling in the, in the market, we can participate in many parts of that. We also participate in some of the IP licensing aspects as well. All right, so. okay. And let's talk about OCP. You mentioned okay. you were there this open year. Compute, what, yeah. What's the state of open compute? Um, what, uh, what's IBM's role? So you know, sort of, you can imagine for yourself a nice Venn diagram. Open compute is very focused on a particular form factor. Uh, open power is, is focused on a particular architecture. You overlap those where we can do an open power, open compute form factor together. Uh, with uh, Rackspace, we've uh, really sort of uh, honed in on a, on a great model with the Barrelai system, and that is uh, you know, available in market today. That's an excellent you know, example of cross-community collaboration. There's no reason that uh, open power needs to come up with some brand new form factor when we can sort of leverage the inertia that open compute has already gleaned in that space. So Rackspace is a consumer of that platform, is they're that right? They're a consumer, they're and, also and a developer. And an inventor, right? I mean, if you will, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So they're, they're playing multiple roles here. Mm -hmm. In fact, at our uh, open power summit in April, we, we got to hear from uh, Rackspace and Google together saying, you know, they're happy with what they're seeing on Power 8, they're already developing for Power 9. In fact, they showed images of that uh, motherboard at that summit. Does, does, does that then tie in with OpenStack? Uh, you know, Rackspace obviously has a yep. very diverse yep. uh, offering now, but you know, at yeah, their core, exactly. they were one of the, the creators. Exactly. So you know, we're not here to create new wheels where we don't need them. So uh, you know, leveraging the best of uh, uh, in class across different pieces of, of where that system will play, from the firmware through to the uh, the board and the chip. You know, th these are things that are very important to us. When you talk to customers like Rackspace and others, what's their motivation? Um, is it workload specific, you know, data intensive yeah. workload? Is it they're trying to cut down on power? What's the business case for them? So in the case of cloud providers, they want to get more VMs on, on a machine. They want to lower their, their uh, cost dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. They also want to make sure that they've got the, the, the pricing right. Uh, so if we're able to lower those costs, which we've been able to effectively do in, in our cloud, with our cloud providers, then that presents a case for them to move to power. They want. Uh, they, they would also prefer that you know the, the underlying architecture, their underlying infrastructure, is um, you know is transparent to some, and others don't want to think about what's under the covers. Right? They just want to drive the car. They don't want to look under the hood, and uh, so that becomes very important as well. We want to be able to present things that are easy to consume. And, uh, and making those as consumable as possible through you know, opening up the APIs, opening up uh, the, the level of integration and, and uh, design as much as possible. So 20% by 2020, what are the kind of phases that you have gone through and have to go through to achieve that objective? Yeah. So you know, the chapters that we're on, we've gone from like whiteboard in year one to uh, you know, here's the vision, here's a couple of PowerPoints on why this is strategic, not just for today, but uh, going forward to year two, really felt more like a science fair where we had you know, 15 pieces of hardware that hadn't existed before, you know, lots of proof of concept things going on, to now we're in year three. This is about adoption, this is about deployment, this is about real uh, you know, use cases that are uh, being deployed in data centers that matter. And that, that sort of starts to you know, get the wheels turning across multiple parts of the industry. And then beyond that, it's roadmap. You mentioned Power9. What, what, yeah. what can you tell us about Power9? So Power9 is great. We're, we've, we're going to be doing a couple of different uh, versions of the chip, one for scale out, one for scale up. Uh, and we're going to continue to have as, uh, as many Autobonds as possible attached to that chip. So we'll continue to have NVLink. We're going to have CAPI, uh, PCIe4. Uh, these are the interconnects to the chip to really take advantage of that uh, performance are, are very uh, useful to our, our system designers and our integrators. And some of this is radical performance. You talk about CAPI. Yeah. Um, we're talking about major advancements in, in performance relative to what yeah. we've been used to. It's a huge step function, isn't it? Is oh, my understanding yeah. correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, no one is going to switch architectures if you're only able to glean one or 2% improvement. You've got to get one or two magnitude improvement, right? You've got to multiply that. 
Uh, and then that, that uh, transition hill is, is easier to climb. So at least 10x is kind of where oh, this is headed, 10X right? 10x for some. Maybe 100x? 5x for others, <laughs> okay. you know? We can hit the 100x on, on some workloads, uh, but it is really important that we're able to get that magnitude improvement. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's just the hill is too high and the, you know, the return is not big enough. And that one to two order of magnitude improvement is, it might necessitate new thinking about how you write applications and, and so forth, but the justification Maybe. is there. Maybe. I think, I think everyone is starting to reevaluate how they're writing applications sure. because in our estimation, systems of the future are all going to include acceleration. So for that, you're going to need to offload particular parts of your, of your work to those accelerators in order for, to get that parallel processing. And, and that's going to be essential in systems as we go forward. Well, and when you think about how applications are written for decades, it's been, okay, there's going to be some spinning disk which is super slow and I'll yeah. be able to do other things while that happens. And Flash hasn't dramatically changed that, right? Yeah. I mean, it, certainly it's sped that up, but in terms of application design, you know, you still have that horrible storage stack and that I.O. that takes place. You're attacking that in, in new ways. Right. And so you would think that that's going to you know, allow developers to take the gloves off yeah. and really create new types of, of innovation. Yeah. Are you seeing more than glimpses of that today? Or are you seeing even glimpses of I that? I think or? the biggest glimpses of that are where we're seeing a leverage of open databases. You know, the, the Kinetica right. examples, right? Like how much you can do in a, a very small amount of time, uh, gleaning uh, value from multiple, um, multiple sources at, at the same time, mm -hmm. not just one spinning disk, right, but, but many, right? right? So being able to capitalize on that is not only going to change how you can get performance out of your existing applications, but also you know, where you can sort of leverage and, and move industries forward. Mm. You know, what, is, this, is this where we come to the next, the next Uber, the next like, transformation of a particular industry? Exciting times, Callisto. Thanks very much for coming to theCUBE and you're sharing welcome. what's going on with Open Power. Really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks uh, for having you're me. You're welcome. Keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE from IBM Edge. We'll be right back.